I, I cut my teeth as a young neurologist uh, taking care of Parkinson's patients. I was just thinking about this 33 years ago to 25 years ago at medical schools, mostly on the East Coast, but also UCLA and U USC. And then I stopped taking care of patients. Uh, it was Parkinson's patients for a very long time. And uh, when it came to UCSB, uh, the only neurology I was doing there, because we don't have a medical school, is helping out at student health. And let me just say, there's not a lot of Parkinson's disease in the student health clinic, fortunately. Um, although there are some students with very rare atypical Parkinson's syndromes and so forth that, that pop, it, pop up there. Um, so I'm not going to talk really about specific kinds of things that current specialists would really, you know, advocate for you to do. Most of this stuff you can t tell back to me. We all know that the, ec the research on exercise and physical activity has been uh, really valuable in showing, you know, that that really slows progression of disease. You know, that's, that's a given. There's all the advances in medical therapies. Uh, pharmaceuticals, we know about those. Uh, we know about deep brain stimulators. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about those things. Uh, I want to talk about work that's really new and it's just percolating up. So this is very, very early stages, but this is how, how things start in, in advancing, you know, new therapies down the line. And this is work with colleagues at Pitt. Uh, we have a big grant to work together. All these people they don't work with humans, they work with non-human primates as who get MPTP as a model of Parkinson's disease to understand brain circuits. We work with people. And people are a lot easier to work with than the monkeys, let me just say. So our funding comes from this, this aligning science across Parkinson's. You've probably all heard of the Michael J. Fox Foundation and the NIH. This is a new foundation that a lot of people don't know about. So I just thought I'd mention it because and they don't do it, it's all very, very basic science-oriented research, and it's to the tune of, I don't know, three quarters of a billion dollars donated by Sergey Brin, one of the founders of Google. And, and so he said, put a team together, or, or put a science board together, and do some fundamental work in Parkinson's. And so right now, this collaborative, what they do are collaborative research networks, so our group is is one of, one of many teams now, there's 35 teams funded over two years. Uh, it's, it's just a, an enormous amount of money they're, they're putting out for each of these teams. They force us, all, all the teams, to get together and work together and discuss things. And so when they started, it was heavily biased towards cell molecular genetics type researchers. What are the genes involved, alpha-synuclein, you've heard all these buzzwords. What are the molecules that are really in, going wrong inside of cells that could lead to Parkinson's? So that kind of fundamental research. And a lot of that is oriented towards something called the endosome, which is this little bag that cells make. Uh, and the best way to think of an endosome is uh, when you try to get your kids to take the trash out, that's what the endosome is. It's like your kid. Their job is to move things in and out of cells. And if you think about it, if the kids don't take the trash out of your house, pretty soon it gets pretty messy in there. And you get this pile up of, of waste materials, OK? And so that's one of the core ideas of what's really driving some of the cell loss in Parkinson's, is particular types of cells have crummy endosomes so they don't clear out the garbage and some of that garbage is abnormal alpha-synuclein. So that's, that's the narrative that a lot of these people are studying. And so that's a long ball question. That's, that's going to take a long time to really figure out. That's really hard cell molecular biology. Then in the second year of funding they brought in groups like ours. We don't do that. What we do is circuits, okay? We ask, like, what are, what are the wiring patterns in the brain that are associated with Parkinson's disease? And, you know, what did that lead to? I saw this car up in Northern California. I don't know if you can read it, but the license plate says, I got DBS. Um, and so, you know, that's 
how do we get to DBS? We got to DBS, deeper in simulation, through understanding circuits. So before talking about these new circuits we're chasing now, I thought I'd just step back historically and remind you of how we got to the DBS that some of you have had or considered getting, and then that may, by doing that, it'll make sense kind of what we're trying to do now, chasing these new circuits. So the brain has, you know, lots of parts and there's lots of connections, right? And so we've got these cortical areas that go through the motor cortex and your brain stem down your spinal cord, not to your muscles and make you move. And so, and then somewhere along the way, back in the 60s, we realized that the signals also go through your basal ganglia, right? That's where the dopamine is and that's where things, that's where things really uh, seem to be awry. How do you make these arrows, right? You see all these arrow diagrams all the time. Um, how do we actually figure these out? Well, I won't go through this in detail, but it's cold, hard anatomy with animals. And so what you do is you take an animal and you inject a tracer in some part of the brain that goes to another part of the brain. You sacrifice that animal, slice up the brain, stain it, and you see where that tracer went to. So these little dots are where they injected, and these other areas are where it went to. And so bit by bit, people trace out all these little connections, and it's really hard, slow anatomy. And uh, it doesn't get enough credit, I think, in sort of being the substrate that really led to things like DBS. And so Peter Strick and our team, he's one of the last sort of card-carrying anatomists uh, in, in the world doing this kind of work. One of the things that came up in the 1980s right away was the idea that you don't need to read the text, you can just look at the pattern. This is your cortex, this is your basal ganglia, these two layers, this is another node, and then all this stuff goes back up to cortex. So you can see there's loops, right? Each of these is a loop. And what we, what my mentors, Strick and DeLong and Alexander, figured out was there's different, different parts of your cortex going through your basal ganglia and make a loop, and then they go right back up to the same part of the cortex. And so different parts of your cortex do different things. So you have parts that do movement, parts that do eye movement, parts that do thinking, parts that do decision making and value judgments, and parts that do sort of emotional regulation. Right? And so if I, now think about if I want to start messing with your basal ganglia, if I, if I mess with this part, I'm going to influence movement. If I, if I influence this part, with the stimulator, what have you, it'll mess with your thinking, your eye movements, your emotional state, and so forth. So now you immediately think about all those side effects people get from deep brain stimulators, right? If you're not in the sweet spot, you're off to the side in one of these nodes, you're going to get other kinds of symptoms. Now the other, so that's one big piece that allowed us to get the deep brain stimulation. A second really big piece was electrophysiology. And this is where you put an electrode into a human or into a monkey or what have you. And so these are some of the nodes in the basal ganglia. This is the globus pallidus. And you can just hook your electrode up to an amplifier with a Radio Shack speaker and just listen. And as you go down through these layers, it kind of go So each layer, each node has its own firing pattern and signature. So just by moving that electrode and listening, you're way down in this deep part of the brain, but you know exactly where you are just by listening. And so in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, people became just masterful at mapping out these deep parts of your brain to figure out what location you were in, whether you were in the globus pallidus external, globus pallidus internal, and so forth. And then the the third piece, you know, was um, 
really pharmacology, knowing that some of, the, some of these tracks are excitatory and some of them are inhibitory. And that led to this crazy wiring diagram that I try to make undergraduates learn and they can never remember it. I can hardly remember it. Uh, but this is the basic sort of wiring diagram of how you, like the motor cortex talks to these deep areas and loops back up. And you can see it's, it's confusing, right? Because you've got these, the red arrows are break and the green arrows mean go. And so you've got all this push-pull going on. Just try, imagine trying to run a, uh, you know, a, a carriage with being pulled by six horses. You've got a lot of push-pull going through this system. And DeLong recognized that in Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, two extreme opposite diseases in terms of clinical symptoms, you could explain a lot of what's going on by just looking at the changes in the weights of these things. If you take the dopamine out of this system, the end result is too much inhibition on the thalamus, and the thalamus can't push your cortex and make you go, okay? So too much stopping leads to not enough going. And Huntington's was the opposite. The loss of some of the connections in here ultimately leads to not enough inhibition and uh, over pushing of your cortex, so ex excessive movements. And we can see this, this, this really, you know, this is complicated here, but the, the end result is really simple. You're either pushing your cortex too hard or not pushing it hard enough, okay? And that explains a lot of movement disorders in, in sort of on first, first blush. So if you take a patient, for example, with Huntington's disease, I don't know if you've seen patients with Huntington's disease, but they have more movements than they need, okay? And so if you watch this man in a classroom, you can, you can see he's, right, he's doing more than he needs to, right? And here's another example. Here's a, a, uh, this is a person where this little nucleus gets a little tiny stroke in it. And the, again, the end result is too much, too much outflow. And it's on the one side of her brain, and so you, she's got excessive movements in her arm. Right? She can't control it. There's, yeah, there's just, she's boosting her movement too much. Now the good news about her is, Patients who get this kind of lesion, injury tend to do better over time. The rest of the system, at least for that injury, kind of can, can accommodate. So a, a few weeks later, she'll, she'll, she'll look uh, pretty much normal. And then for a lot of Parkinson's patients, um, if you take too much of your dopamine, right? If you have too much l cinnamet this, uh, this is a severe example. It's a little disturbing, but... You know, he's, uh, he's talking and he's, he's cognitively with it, but the, he's just got too much cinnamon on board. So that's making him go, 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 go. So that's one of the classic problems of, of uh, long-term or, or uh, high doses of cinnamon combined with um, having had Parkinson's disease for a long time, right? You get these uh, overreactions to your, to your medications. So this was sort of the basic idea. This, this whole circuit model led, uh, led really conceptualize why deep brain stimulators might work. But before we got to that, there was one more step that convinced people to go for it. It was sort of an intermediate step. And, and it really started with this guy, Irving Cooper. He was a surgeon in the 60s, 50s and 60s, who noticed that patients who had little strokes that knocked out these deep nuclei uh, Parkinson's patients who had this, some of them actually got better. And they could handle their medications better. They're, they're, they did better with their cinnamon. Just spontaneous, this little artery plugs up and they get a little stroke there. But it's a fortuitous stroke. You rarely hear that, right? And most strokes make you worse. This was a case where paradoxically the patients were doing better. So, so what's going on there? But if you put that into that circuit model, it starts to make sense. What he's saying is, in Parkinson's, you've got too much breaking going on, not enough facilitation. So if we can just 
that stroke's going to shut down all this stuff. It's going to allow the thalamus to push the cortex and, and let things go. So that was the idea. So uh, my mentor, Malin DeLong, said, well, let's, let's go in there with our in, into Parkinson's patients with their microelectrodes, with really, really careful measurements, and we'll go to just this one part of the one nucleus, globus pallidus internal. Not just that nucleus, but we'll go to the back side lower corner of that nucleus. That's how good they were at recording. And burn a little hole there. Just snip the wires, cut the wires there, okay? And that's pallidotomy, okay? And my job with him was to do brain imaging and also to pick the patients who would get this, um, who would be an appropriate candidate. And I did the first study saying, well, if you do this, it ought, to, it ought to turn the cortex back on, right, when you're moving. And that's, this is a little hard to see, but these white dots, this is an old, old, old study. We're basically turning the motor areas. After you've had your pallidotomy and you just do a simple movement, uh, you, you, you get a restitution of function in the cortical areas. It should be activated. So it's consistent with this idea. Your thalamus is telling your cortex to go again and is going. So we had nice consistent findings between the brain scans and, and uh, what they were doing in, in the operative suite with the patients. And we did a big study, I was part of this, just showing that, yeah, patients who get a pallidotomy, they do better, both in terms of their on time, uh, less of the drug-induced dyskinesias or side effects of the medications, and so it works. And so we were so proud of this, and. But then this, this hurricane came in, and that was the stimulators, okay? Right when we were finishing this, everybody realized, well, why not just put a stimulator in? And, and then the argument was, where do you put the stimulator? Because you, you, you have a couple of these different places you could, you could stick in a, a, a deep brain stimulator. So the argument was, uh, should we do that instead? And if we do it, where should it go? It turns out, um, there was a lot of preference for doing the stimulators because doing those selective lesions where you burn a little hole, that's almost a dark art. There's only a few people in the country, like DeLong, who could do that really well and, and reliably. Most neurosurgeons are just kind of winging it, okay? Whereas a stimulator, you can kind of get it in there close and then you have the different leads and you can play around with the leads and and work with it until you really get a, good, a better response with the patient. And, and so there was a lot of preference for doing the stimulators rather than, you know, uh, a, a lesion. And this other nucleus, we couldn't really safely burn a hole in it because it's just, it's in a too tricky of a spot. Uh, the safety wasn't good enough. So it was only in this one place you could do it. And so everybody shifted their focus to stimulators. And there, was two, there were two places you could do it. One was the globus pallidus. And again, you needed it in the lower outer back corner of the globus pallidus. Or you could do it in the subthalamic nucleus, uh, which is a tinier nucleus. It's like the size of a lentil bean, the subthalamic nucleus. It's, it's small. But the good news is you can, you can reliably get one of your electrode contacts into it almost, in almost every patient and you can find a sweet spot. The problem with globus pallidus is almost it's too big. Uh, it can be harder to hit the sweet spot. And so most surgeons now use subthalamic stimulators. And we did studies on and off stimulator. And again, we saw the same sort of thing we saw before. What you're doing with the stimulator is you're shutting that nucleus off. It's like you're putting in a jamming signal. So the downstream effect is you're activating the cortex, you're allowing it to activate more, and we see that in our brain scans. We get a restitution of normal-like activity in the cortical areas uh, when we turn a stimulator on, if it's in the right spot and it's adjusted appropriately. This is, in recent years, this, this imaging approach has gone full circle. I don't know who's had deep brain stimulators here, but again, there's sort of an art form to programming that stimulator. And it turns out one of the most effective ways to program a stimulator 
is actually to put a patient in a scanner and look at how, how well you're activating your motor cortex from the images of the scan rather than just looking at them move themselves. And so you can use the scans to tune your, to tune, to tune your stimulator. So it's come a long, long way in, in 30 years. So I'm not going to show these, but this is the number of studies that have compared stimulators in the globus pallidus from the subthalamic nucleus. There's just a ton of them, right? Um, these are all randomized trials. Should you get, should you get a stimulator in one spot or the other spot? Uh, the bottom line is most surgeons like to put it in the STN, subthalamic nucleus, because it's easier to get there, to get a contact there. You know, you're more likely to be successful. And uh, overall, you get um, less reduction. You get better reductions in the amount of medication you need. More on time, more movement with the blessed coast. Now, the downside of the subthalamic nucleus is it has all those loops going through it, the cognitive loops, the affective loops, the emotional loops, and so forth. And so um, you can get more side effects there, because you could be your jamming signal could be influencing not just the motor path, motor loops, but also cognitive loops and other things. So you're at a little bit greater risk of cognitive sequelae with the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, but that's, that, that's our trade-up. Um, and, you know, this was a big deal, right? It, this was such a huge breakthrough. It happened so fast in my career. We, were, we went from like, well, maybe we should try you know, literally burning a hole in a person's brain to routinely putting stimulators in people in less than 10 years, which for medical advances is just mind-blowing. And it was all because we understood the circuits, we understood where the push and pull was, we understood the anatomy uh, and the physiology. And DeLong, we got the, the Lasker Prize, which is like an inch short of the Nobel Prize in the prize world. It's, it's a true honor. And Benavid was the neurosurgeon who, who really pushed that deep brain stimulators. Okay, so where are we at with conventional stimulators now? Okay, so some of you have stimulators or you're looking at them. Like where, where's, the, where's the hot research in, in conventional stimulators? I think this is it. Uh, and I don't know if anybody in Santa Barbara is doing this, but if, if you can get in a trial where they're doing this, it's, it's, I think, worth doing, okay? So I don't do this, and it's all about, you have your stimulator in, can we be more clever about how we program it, okay? So conventionally, your stimulator is just going, pop, 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 pop. it's just putting in a jamming signal into that one nucleus, okay? What this one's doing is you have these four little electrodes at the tip of the stimulator, at the tip of the you know, probe going in, and it's pseudo-randomly sweeping through them, so it's basically dancing between the electrodes. And it does that in bursts, okay? So it's, it's like a little dance. Stop. Stop. So it's spreading out the jamming signal both in time and space. And what that does is you get a lot less uh, battery discharge because you're not firing off all the time, so you don't have to change the battery all the time. That's a good thing. Um, it's a lot less energy, and there's this neat thing where if you turn one of these on, you see people just keep getting better and better. A regular stimulator, you sort of get you get an effect, and then and then there you go, it just stays. Whereas these guys. You can, you can turn them on, you see an effect, you turn the stimulator off, and they keep getting better. Right? This is your Parkinson's problems, right? They keep going down over time. So it's, it's like remodeling all the activity in your basal ganglia and really influencing um, sort of how movement is, is getting generated. These, there's animal studies on this, there's human trials going on. Uh, a lot of them have been out of Minnesota, but, um, and I haven't really looked hard at who's doing it on the West Coast, but it, it, it's called coordinated reset. That's the, that's the jargon. So it's coordinated resetting of, of your stimulator. And it's just a, it, I think it'll become an FDA-approved approach really fast. 
Okay, now I want to change and talk about what we're doing now, okay? Uh, any questions before I do that? Okay. Uh, so this, I thought I'd conditionalize. Uh, so this was out in the field the other day. This is from two weeks ago. It got warm. It's a rattlesnake, right? Uh, has anybody ever come across a rattlesnake? It's amazing how vibrant you become, right? <laughs> I've actually used to do a lot of trail running, and several times I found myself flying through the air like Michael Jordan, not even knowing why. And as I'm flying, I look down, and there's a you know, snake snoozing on the, across the trail. And, and so the idea is that's like, that's the natural built-in version of what we're calling paradoxical kinesia, uh, this ability to move in a Parkinson's patient paradoxically, but in the rest of us, adaptively, right? So we, the idea is we have these really fast, frugal, automatic systems in our brain for making this move, right, that, uh, that are there to save us. And uh, Joe Adu has focused on this, he's a researcher who focused on this one part of the brain called the amygdala, which is sort of like an early, early warning detection system. So if you're, if you're moving along and you suddenly see a bear, you suddenly see a rattlesnake, that's, that's, the, that's the brain system or the, the circuit that's recognizing that trouble. And it recognizes it before you, you know, consciously do. And it'll induce fear, uh, but it also can recognize positive emotions as well. If you see something beautiful, it can also draw you towards it. But most of the research has looked at sort of fearful stimuli, but it goes both ways. So you see the bear, this system goes whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> blood pressure, your heart rate, and you start moving, right? And so we thought maybe, maybe this is an interesting alternative way to drive movement. It's not part of that loop I was showing you earlier, that circuit I was showing you. And we really didn't understand how you go from this this, this nucleus to your movements, right? How does it get into your motor system? There's a big unknown that's been ignored. So here's, I don't know if you've seen ever, anybody's ever seen uh, Gavin Mogan. He's, he's sort of the, the advocate, he's the patient advocate of uh, paradoxical movement. So he has uh, mid-stage you know, Parkinson's disease. I'll just show a video of him. He's gonna go, he's, he's a jock. He's going to go to his gym, uh, and somebody gives him a bear hug. So he, you know, he comes in with his Parkinson's symptoms, his movements, and then somebody gives him a bear hug, and watch what happens after he gets a bear hug. Now, I don't recommend this for everybody. I mean, it's like, it's crazy, right? <laughs> so he's, he's the extreme example. I wish everyone was like this. Yeah. And here he is, you know. So he, he's, he's, you know, he's got Parkinson's, right? I mean, so here he is when he's having trouble moving. moving and now he... He's done something to get himself excited, and off he goes to the races. So he can switch this on and off like a clock, right? Uh, fascinating, fascinating patient. Uh, and so that's, so what we think is this early warning detection system is, has a circuit that gets into the motor cortex, and if somehow we could drive that, that's, that's a whole new approach for creating movement. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, we did a study years ago uh, where, oh uh, gosh, this is a long time ago. If, if uh, you're doing this computer game and I subliminally flash the name of your beloved, okay, you have Parkinson's and I flash your beloved's name, you, you, you don't even recognize it, right? It's subliminal suggestions. And I do that versus an acquaintance's name. If it's your sublimate, if it's your a beloved's name for the next hour, 
that Parkinson's patient actually moves better. Right, so that might not be the same circuit, but there's all these ways of sort of like kicking the system a little bit, right? Um, we think this, this, is, this may be more potent than that. So this guy, Gavin, he's really experimented with himself. He's got, you can go on YouTube and waste a night watching his selfie videos, but um, and he sort of like, he, he figured out like, what is it that really gets us going? If he, if he allow anything that's kind of fearful, will do it. Like if he lets himself fall down, like he'll do this in the snow, just let himself do a face plant in the snow. Like blah, that gets him moving. Hugs get him moving. Swinging a baseball bat gets, it, gets him going. So I'll just it kind of, I think each patient there's going to be something, you know, there might be something that works better than something else. We don't know. It, it, these are all sort of, you know, stories people tell. You know, you hear of patients who say, well, the grandkid was about to fall down the stairs and I jumped up and ran over and picked him up, you know? That's a, that's a good case. Um, during times of earthquakes, hurricanes, and tornadoes, Parkinson's patients move a lot better. Uh, there's, there's, <laughs> there's papers showing that. Right? So, so it's, it's there, we just haven't captured the best way of you know, using it yet. So that's the circuit we're chasing now. We're trying to figure this out. So we know, we know it comes in through this, um, where am I? Yeah. It's coming in through the amygdala. That's getting into, these, into this system. And so we've got some big question marks in the circuit. Like how does it get from these early areas up into the motor cortex and get you zooming? Your, your regular loop with the jamming signals and the bad rhythms and so forth, it can just come in and just override that. Yeah. Um, that's, that's what we, we expect, but that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Sounds like all of which is common in Parkinson's to generate that type of response. Only if you fell, they'd be able to get up and draw and keep it right yeah. for the moment. Yeah, that's why I think Gavin may be a little odd because most patients don't, they aren't too happy when they fall and they don't move much, yeah. Um, yeah. So he said that up. He's not surprised, like, surprised that the adrenaline is. No. Yeah, well, that's a great question. So is this adrenaline or is this something else? So, um, so it's, 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 problem is y'all learn in, in psychology there's fight or flight it's your adrenaline and that's all there but this is a much more specific circuit that's um, it's not just about arousal or fight and flight it's a little it's, it's a little more specific than that now what's interesting is if you your motor cortex once you start running like once Gavin starts running that actually tells his adrenal to make more adrenaline. So we always think of adrenaline as just sort of like this reflex hormone, but it's actually getting driven by the motor areas themselves. So it's all these loop, interesting loops. So that's, that, that's you know, I'll, I'll finish up here, but this is, this is the pathway we're looking at. You don't need, I don't know why I put that up there. It's way too complicated. But so how do, how do we do this, okay? We've got our teammates in Pittsburgh who are doing just like I showed you earlier with the anatomy and the physiology and figuring out the circuit sort of that way. We're doing it with people and uh, we do it with imaging. And so, so far all we've been studying is, is normal, basically graduate students and postdocs. And we have a super duper scanner down at USC that we use for some of the studies. And we can look at any one brain area. So this is a person just laying in the scanner or making a movie of brain activity over an hour. And you can say for any one area, does, does the next door neighbor area also sort of respond in the same way? Are they connected somehow, functionally? And so we, we're starting to identify each of these nodes in the circuit just by looking at people laying in the scanner. We also do it through kind of, not fight or flight, but uh, challenge tasks uh, it, at, at the scanner at UCSB. And so, you know, if you think about it, uh, we're trying to invigorate movement, 
we can be invigorated to capture rewards and also to avoid costs. Um, so how do you do this experimentally? We do just so, these are really simple, boring, fun tasks. You have a cursor and one of these two is gonna be lit up. You have to move the cursor up to the dot as fast as you can. If you don't go fast enough, you don't get a reward. And we have a little smiley face to let you know which way to go. Easy enough, go that way or go that way. On any trial, you don't know which way you're gonna go. But now, now it's incentivized. This is a little hard to see, but if it's a neutral face, you get 20 cents if you get there fast enough. If it's a happy face, you get a buck 60. And if it's a sad face, you lose buck 60. One, uh, buck 60. So this is a great task for undergraduates. They'll really work hard at this. Dollar 60 is a lot of money for some people still. And what's neat is this is just my only data slide, people move faster if they're gonna make some money. That's, what's interesting is they don't move faster for the slow, for losing money. At least people are like that, okay? Uh, people will go, so we can invigorate movement with rewards. I won't go through this in detail, but monkeys are the opposite. Monkeys actually kinda go the same speed, they just kinda work. But if it's a risk of losing money, then they go fast. So monkeys and people are diff different in how they appraise reward and cost. But in both species, we can, just with a simple stimuli, we can speed movement up or not, right? That's the whole point of this. The idea is that's a tool for looking at this circuit. And then, uh, and we can see these brain, act brain areas active when, when you're invigorated to move, so this is, just when you see, if you see that happy face versus this neutral face, and you know it's going to be a reward, this is before the person has even started moving. You can see all these motor areas kicking in, going, oh boy, I, I want to get that reward. And so what we want to know with Parkinson's patients is, would, could we get the same areas to kick in when, when, when a Parkinson's patient sees that reward? Or if they see the cost and they don't want to lose the money. Uh, now, that, that's one of three tasks. I'll show you the other two, and then I'll take questions and we'll stop. The other task is just a simple, this is an old-fashioned psychology experiment. Uh, so you get a countdown from 18 to 1, and, uh, and then you get a go cue. And if you don't move fast enough, you get a shock. <laughs> so that's an incentive, right? Uh, I don't know. Psychologists love to shock people. We've been doing that for 100 years. Uh, and so you can have mild shocks or, or uh, unpleasant shocks. And uh, we won't worry about controllable, uncontrollable. But the idea is if it's, if it's going to be a big shock, you're going to move faster to, to present, prevent yourself from getting hurt. So this is a little bit like the rattlesnake effect, right? You, boom, i got to move faster. This is not going to be good. So uh, mediated? In what way? Uh, yeah, it's very fast. Yeah, all these are, you know, these are quick, quick. Uh, and that's the whole point of this, what would do is circuit, he called it the low road. So the high road is your conscious afraid, oh, there is a snake, I should be careful. Let me think about it, I'll, I'll probably walk around here versus, right? We want, we want these immediate, fast, uh, low road responses. And then the, the last task is just, it's just pictures. So you see happy things or scary things, like if somebody pointing a gun at you. And you either push or pull, depending on whether you think it's happy or sad. And we change the rules around, so sometimes if it's a happy thing you pull towards you, and sometimes if it's a happy thing you push away from you. And there's this funny effect in, in psychology where your default is if it's something scary, you're much quicker pushing it away than you are pulling it towards you. And if it's something nice, you're much quicker pulling it towards you than pushing it away. So that's a neat little clever manipulation we can use to, to look at this immediate kind of reactive processing. 
And the idea is these, this low road circuit doesn't, you know, it's, it's reacting to, the, to the, the valence, the niceness of these stimuli. So again, it's just another way of trying to turn on these nodes and follow them through and identify targets. So that's, that's, that's what we're doing. And our, and our colleagues are doing similar sorts of things with non-human primates that have been uh, rendered Parkinsonian at Pitt. And uh, yeah, it, I'm, I'm enthused about this because this is a brand new, uh, brand new kind of circuit that no one's considered before. And the last time we looked at circuits, it ended in pretty, pretty significant advances in, in deep brain stimulation technologies and treatments. So we're hoping that this will, will have some pay dirt as well, that you know, we can um, find suitable targets you know, in the brain for this. So let me finish with my pitch, which is if you're a Parkinson's patient and you want to come out to UCSB, you can get shocked, you, <laughs> you, can, you can push pull, you can play for money. <laughs> Dealer's choice. Uh, those are the experiments. Um, the kinds of patients we're recruiting, um, mild to moderate motor problems. We need you be, to be able to walk over to the elevator from the parking lot to come down to the scanner. We have a scanner in the basement in the psychology building. You have to have good cognition and mood. Um, and that's you know, what you decide that. Um, we can't put DBS patients in our scanner, but if you do have a, a DBS stimulator and want to do this, we, we can do the things outside of the scanner uh, where you can help us. Obviously, it's MRI, so you can't have pacemakers, all that kind of stuff, you know, you can't have metal in you, particularly a pacemaker or, or hearing, implanted hearing devices. Um, we do all the testing on your regular medicines. So that's nice. You don't have to, like some studies, they require you to withdraw off your medicines overnight. That's really hard on a patient. Just, we do everything, we just take everything regular the way you would, always do it. Um, and then what we have you do is we torment you with a couple questionnaires about your Parkinsonism. Um, I'll take a look at you to see how your motor performance is, just a little quick exam, and then we do the MRI scanning. And uh, what do you get? Will you help us? That's a huge piece. Um, we get, you get a pictures of your brain, digital pictures. You can look them on your computer. You get paid $20 an hour plus bonuses for these rewards. And the most important thing is there's free parking next to the center, which at UCSB is the single hardest thing. <laughs> so if you're interested, um, over on the table, there's some handouts. Uh, for, with the contact information, you can just grab one and give us a call. And uh, actually, there's an email address there, and, and we'll run from it. Yeah, it's it's one time unless unless you're a glutton for punishment and want to do all three of the tasks. <laughs> Some people, you know, it, and we're not we're not looking to do 500 patients. This is a plausibility study. The idea is, can we? Despite your Parkinson's, can we see this circuit being driven by these tasks, which tells us it's sort of preserved, right? So we can kind of end run what's going on in the regular motor circuits through the imaging. Yeah. Yeah. Can you be a little more specific, please, about what exactly you mean by good cognition? Because we've all had a pretty much experiencing normal age-related cognitive decline in this room. And Parkinson's is kind Yes, yes. So, I, I, Well, if, if a person has clinical depression that is currently being treated, that's fine. Um, if a person has clinical depression that's not being treated, that's not okay. And um, we, we actually, the quest, one of the questionnaires for depression, one of the questionnaires we use is the Beck Depression Inventory, which is just a, a, like a rating scale. You get, you know, do you wake up uh, 
unhappy, you know, questions like that, right? Just yes, simple questions. So we go, we can go through that. We can, in fact, we can do that ahead of time. And so, if a person's really having problems, you know, we would say, hey, let's not do it. Uh, and then cognition, we use the Montreal task, which is a 30, que 30 item uh, questionnaire. Can you remember three items in three minutes? Can you copy this figure? Uh, can you repeat some sentences? It's, so it's, it's pretty basic, and, and most, be, most Parkinson's patients can, can pass it, I think. Yes? Um, are you working with Medtronic or um, Boston Scientific? Not yet. So what we're trying to do is see whether this is a plausible circuit to even target. And they're focused on maximizing what they can do with the existing technologies and targets. Well, I understand that Medtronic's coming out with a system that can backfeed, so to speak. Yeah. Do you know anything about that? You probably know more than I do. Yeah, so there are these, there are these adaptive systems that both sense and respond. Um, so they're both recording in your brain and then um, firing off. So that's a, that's a, I'm not your guy to, to really tell you what, I don't, I don't know the literature enough to, to know are they the best new thing or not. But you know, that's, that's like, we're a long ball kind of question. That's a, that's probably, that's a short horizon question, yeah. Is there any evidence that PTS produces any symptoms of Parkinson's besides dysphagia? Uh, Okay, so, yeah, the question is, is there any evidence that DBS does anything other than reduce dyskinesias? Oh, and the answer is yes. Uh, you get, there's no question you get increased on time with your medications if you have a stimulator. There's no question that the dosage that's required, now this is on average, there's, there's going to be individual differences. There's also really clear evidence that the dosage required to get you where you were before is much smaller, okay? So that also helps the dyskinesias. I always like to think of it as like, um, it's basically bringing you back like three years or so in terms of your clinical progress, okay? Which is, I'll take three years, right? Uh, but yeah, there, it's not enough, right? That's why we're chasing all these other other targets and things because, you know, it's not going to make you 28 years old again. It, it, uh, it has some limits. The other thing it doesn't really help with is the autonomic problems, the gut, right, the gut and all that. It just doesn't touch that. So on the side, I didn't talk about this, but on the side, we're really focused on how your sympathetic nervous system reacts to all these crazy tasks we have because that's a big piece for patients who have blood pressure problems and orthostasis, right? A little lightheadedness when they get up. So we've, that's another whole area for targeting is, is driving your autonomic nervous system so that the body control is better. So um, we're heavily invested in that it's on the side. Yes? Is essential tremor and Parkinson's always go together? I mean, can someone have essential ET and not get into a Parkinson's situation? And I understand that there are different kinds or levels of Parkinson's, like atypical Parkinsonism, all the Parkinsonisms. Can yes. you address that? Sure. Um, so for every one Parkinson's patient with classic you know, textbook Parkinson's disease, there's probably 10 to 20 patients with essential tremor who will never get uh, Parkinson's disease. So essential tremor is this fine action tremor. It's there when you do things. And the classic test word is give them a really full glass of water and just say take a sip without spilling it, right? So that's essential tremor. And now Parkinson's, the classic tremor is the rest of tremor, right? It's slower. It's more rhythmic, uh, and it's not in every patient. Like two, so a third to half patients have that tremor, but a lot have no tremor whatsoever. And then there are people who have both essential tremor and Parkinson's just because of bad luck. 
And they're, they're very different. Like none of the Parkinson's medicines will do anything to an essential tremor. Uh, but essential tremor can be quite, quite debilitating. Just think of Catherine Hepburn when her voice got really, you know, she had the kind that was really in her, in her chest. And voice, most people, it's in their hands. Uh, as, a, as an aside, you know, it's kind of interesting that, that the story behind the stimulators that I didn't tell you is the first approval for a stimulator was for essential tremor. And it was in the thalamus, uh, which is that last nucleus that goes to the, to the motor areas. And uh, it works great there. And uh, guess who had that done? Uh, Michael J. Fox. I think he was in early, early, uh, right? Yeah, so he had his plant uh, stimulators or thalamotomy. And we, when we first started putting stimulators in the subthalamic nucleus, we couldn't get it reimbursed by insurance. But then we said, well, it's thalamus, subthalamus, it's, it's the same area, and, and they started paying for it. Only because the two nodes almost were named identically. So, uh, so we could get it paid for in Parkinson's patients through the insurance carriers. Yeah. What medication is for essential benefits? Alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Propranolol. Yeah, Propranolol. They're all, they all kind of work. None of them are. Okay. The only one that absolutely works is alcohol. Now, I'm not recommending that. Uh, a colleague at NIH tried for years to get something uh, called octanol approved, but he couldn't get any pharmaceutical company to pick it up, because it's basically alcohol that doesn't get you drunk, but it gets rid of your tremor. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a sister molecule to, to ethanol, uh, but it just could never get it to market. But uh, no, uh, there's, there's, there's um, beta blockers, um, propranolol is the most common one. Propranolol. Is that the is another one, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's tough. Um, yeah. Oh, so I saw something about Stanford University doing this research in vibration therapy, and they had this glove on this man that was extremely shaky and like can't be walking after the vibration therapy. He was able to do everything that was normal. Was it essential, Trevor? Did he have Parkinson's no, he had disease? Parkinson's. Yes. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Don't know it, uh, but um, that's my that's my loss. Yeah. I'm just because it's my loss that I don't know that. But um, yeah, it, it's a good for me. I mean, so I think, well, why would that work? <laughs> and, uh, well, did they do something years ago with this researcher? This is years ago. People have trained and trained a lot more shaking, but they got out of training. Yeah. And so it could be through this open loop path as well, this pathway we're looking at, where the, this uncertainty and instability and in, in, uh, it's dynamic kind of input could also be something that runs through this circuit. Totally. Great idea. Yeah. If you have these sudden, uh, oh, you're talking about the bad state. Have sudden, I guess in the case like you, it blocks the electrodes. If that's unexpected, is it a stronger effect uh, than if you, you, know, you yeah. go into a party and you know you're going to see people and you know what will probably happen, but something unexpected like a snake or a bear, does that make? Yeah, I, surprise, surprise, I think surprise turbocharges the effect, yeah. Is the, re, the return to normalcy, is it stronger? I mean, uh, when you come down from it, is it more, is it a deeper regression? Uh, uh, I mean, do you go into it? You go back to where you were, yeah, um, over a few. Regression or uh, from no, I don't think so. No, there's no evidence of that. You've all seen uh, uh, the, the video of the bicyclist in the Netherlands. It's a pretty famous 
So that might be this vibration effect as well. It, uh, just another variation, or it could also be the pathway we're looking at. So this is a pa Parkinson's patient who can hardly walk. And they help them out onto the street in the Netherlands, and they put them on a bicycle and sh shove them off, and he rides perfectly normal. I mean, he's just around the street, and when he's done, he jumps off the bike, perfectly normal, and then he's, you know, back in at Parkinson's. So it's fascinating, right? And horses, yeah. So I think, yeah, so, so, so it could be there's like two circuits here, right? There's two circuits we're thinking about. One is uh, the one we're looking at, which is sort of like visual stimuli that really kick you in, right? And the other is, is postural, right? Feedback through your body, whether it's a horse or the bicycle, the pattern movements, the train. And that could be another circuit that we just we just haven't defined it yet, right? We got the phenomenology, but we don't. You can see how how slow brain science works, right? Okay, yeah. Well, what's the pathway? How does it get up to your cortex? Don't know. Yeah, yeah. I think that this. You're right. This this the stationary bike just helps you with your physical fitness and slows the progression of your disease. So it's good in that dimension. Whether or not a regular bicycle is going to, first you got to know you can ride a regular bicycle safely. And if you can't, then you can experiment with yourself. I mean, that's, I, if there's one thing you want to go home with here, it's kind of do some experiments on yourself. If you have Parkinson's, see if there are things, a hug, a surprise, a rattlesnake. <laughs> uh, what is it about, you know, see if you can find something that opens, opens up your movement. Uh, I think dance can do it in some people. Oh, and this is, and the boxing, right? What's the deal with the boxing? <laughs> right? Makes sense, right? So uh, that's another example where, you know, you've got this looming, threatening thing, and it, it, it really invigorates a lot of, a lot of people. So there, it's out there. We just need to, to do some more uh, experiments and observations. Um, yeah, I'm boxing the guy getting paid, but... I know you're... <laughs> um, your amygdala your doesn't know that. <laughs> uh, what you're doing is having to think about something while you're exercising. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, but I think it engages the circuit. Any, any kind of potential threat, if you have a threat, it's going to get the system.